Welcome, everyone. This is the January 2023 Imaging SIG, and we've got Dave Payne to talk to us about generalized hyperbolic stretch, giving us some examples. Dave, what's up? Hi, Hi everyone. Uh, I'm back to talk, uh, give the second part, at least, of the generalized hyperbolic stretching um, script and module talk. Um, again, this is a, a, strip, a, a script um, and a process, and I'm going to be focusing on the process tonight for stretching your astro images. This was put together by uh, Mike Cranfield and myself, and uh, um, we're just two astronomer, amateur astronomers with some synergistic backgrounds. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to uh, kick off the talk. Um, but before, before I go on, um, I do want to talk about the first part and do a quick review of the parameters in GHS used to, um, used to stretch, control your stretch of your images. So I'm going to open up GHS. Um, so the first talk was about understanding the stretch. And in particular, I want to talk um, just go over these parameters because they're important to know as we're conducting stretch so you can follow what I'm doing. Remember the first of our five key parameters was the amount of stretch that we call big D for daddy. And um, you can tell how much it's stretching um, an image. And I'm still now focusing on this grayscale image here by how far our stretch curve varies from a 45 degree line on our histogram plot, and the distance that it gets um, is away from that line is how much it's brightening if it's above the line or dimming if it's belowing, below the line. And as we add stretch, as we add stretch, as we add D to our stretch, the stretch gets further and further away. And that brightening causes the histogram to move to the right. The slope or the steepness of our red line is actually the contrast um, that we're redistributing around the image. So where the, where the stretch is steepest, we're actually adding contrast because it's steeper than I, our identity line. And where it's shallower and less steep, we're actually taking contrast away. That's because there's only so much contrast in an image to go around. So if we add it to some place, we have to take it from someplace else. Where we are adding stretch contrast, it tends to push the histogram down and uh, where it is being taken away, the histogram goes up. The second parameter is actually a third parameter listed here, but the second one, is with GHS, we're able to control exactly where we're adding that most contrast. At zero, we can see we're adding the most contrast down here at zero, but we can put that maximum contrast add wherever we want. So you can see that as we move that point, the histogram tends to move away or spread out from where we're adding that most contrast. Of course, you can see that the brightness that we're creating and the contrast are both related. The last two parameters here, LP and HP, are used to semi-de-link that brightness from the contrast. We can go from the top and push the, the histogram down by darkening from the top, and that would potentially provide protection for stars, or we can do the opposite from the other side. The next parameter I'm going to talk about, the last of the five, is this B, B, B for little B for babies that I'm going to be talking about. It controls the shape of the stretch. It starts off at zero, which is the broadest stretch that can take place. But as I move away from zero, first on the positive side, you can see it intensifies 
that contrast add right at SP and decreases that farther away from SP at the ends. So I can still move SP wherever I want and I can change the shape. I can also go away from zero on the negative side. And this is for very uh, fine adjustments. Um, but again, the further I get now in a negative sense away from zero, B actually fights D, but it, uh, but it uh, becomes a very much more gentle stretch all in all. So I'm gonna be using these parameters to both perform initial stretches on images as well as, um, as well as some refinement stretches as we go along. If you recall from our first video, um, oh, I closed the GHS accident. If you recall from our first video, um, we did a stretch on the heart and soul nebula. And I do want to um, reset the stretch here because I want to talk a little bit about the histogram and what it should look like. And this character is going to come out through the rest of the presentation today. Um, I tend to look at the log scale. And you see, we've got an image. This is showing the histogram of this image on the left. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, not a bad stretch. It's not a bad image. And I wanted to bring it up so I could show you what, on looking at a log scale, the histogram tends to look like for successful stretches and successful images. Basically, the components are first a rise from the left to a histogram peak. The second stage is a histogram peak. It tends to go over the peak and then down from the peak. And then it tends to go along more or less a straight line, more or less a straight line. It can have some slight curves to it, but it won't have bumps and valleys as you go along. And then end up on the right-hand side, on the bright side, either switching to a steeper slope or actually coming to a cliff. And what you want to make sure you avoid in this case is too much curve on the right-hand side, curving up, saying that star brightness is bunching up on the right-hand side of my histogram, making the stars overly bright um, without any contrast and, uh, and uh, bloated potentially. So that's it for the review. That's a summary. It took me uh, two hours to talk about that last time, but I'm going to leave that because today we're going to move on to the applications. Did I lose that view graph? I think in my uh, parts, I did lose that view graph. Um, but I'm going to show you applications. I'm going to show you how to stretch your initial image. I'm going to show you um, how to do some follow-up stretches to make any corrections. But I tend to have it integrated into my workflow because I'm going to talk about some of the other, other, other processes that we use in PixInsight and how it's really good to have GHS used to set up the, the working of those processes and then after the processes are run, how GHS can be used to um, fix any unintended consequences of doing those processes. I'm gonna show you all about separating stars and what impact that has on your stretch, separating color, how to handle color, how to calibrate color. And I'm gonna be showing RGB images as well as uh, narrowband images and how to work with all of those. So, one last thing before I start, we start stretching some images. I want to just go over those ground rules. And all I want to say about the ground, ground rules here is that um, because of the formulation and the implementation, your data will retain intact when you go through GHS. It's one of the few processes that can actually say that. Um, so you've always got a way to undo. You can either either go back to a previous image, but you can always undo. There's an invert button that you can click 
and undo. And I'm actually going to show you a, a few tricks with that invert button because it really stands GHS on its head and uh, allows for a whole uh, bunch of extra things. But because of these formulations, you can do stretches all day long. Your data won't get tired of being stretched. So you can do a whole bunch of little refinements and it won't get tired. At the same time, it is a bit of a limitation. Um, because of its formulation, the rank order of pixel brightness will remain the same in your image, um, no matter how you, basically no matter how you stretch it. Other processes will be changing that rank order. Um, and sometimes that's necessary in order to get the image that you want. Um, and essentially, changing the rank over the pixels is what all the other processes are for. Um, um, so that'll make a little bit more sense to you as, as I move, move along. So the first image I'm going to stretch here is, is really a drive-by imaging, um, not much thought gone into it, of the moon monochrome image, and I open it up, and you can see even in linear form, you can see the outline of the moon barely, and here's the, here's the histogram that goes with it. And I'm gonna go through the same process for this image as we went through for that heart and soul nebula that I showed you in the last talk. So what I wanna do is I wanna zoom on the left-hand side, and you can see I'm zooming a little bit too much here. A little bit different image, but I can see where my histogram peak is. It's still on the far left hand side. And the first thing I want to do is do a black point adjustment. Because I'm looking at the log scale, here's my non log scale of the histogram. I can see there are no data points here. And I can achieve a black point by switching over to the linear type stretch clicking on where I want the black point to be set. I just want it fairly close to that peak. I can send that to the black point and then I can execute that right on my image. Reset sends me back to the generalized hyperbolic stretch. Now in the GHS mode, I can click on my histogram peak just as I did for the, for, uh, the heart and soul nebula send that to SP, increase my B factor because I want this to be gentle on the brights. Now this is my standard procedure for initializing. Then I start to add D and you can see my histogram move to the right. And what I can do is just keep moving it until I'm getting something on my histogram. So here's a preview of what I'm doing. So I'm going to take that D back. And as I add D, you can see my moon come out of the shadows. It is a crescent moon. But I'm looking at my histogram now, and I can see I'm doing something that I need to watch for as I'm stretching images. If you recall, I'm um, is that I'm bifurcating the histogram. I'm actually splitting it in two. And actually what you'll find is this part of the histogram is actually my moon. And this part of the histogram is actually everything else. Pretty much. I can move SP back and forth. So as I move SP, it's splitting it in a slightly different place. Now I'm moving well ahead of the histogram peak. So the histogram peaks moving back but I really don't want to do this. You, you can get away with it and you can say that image isn't too bad, but really when you see something like this, the first thing you want to do is, let's see if I can get away with reducing my B factor. And you can see that's actually making it worse. So I'm going to return that back up to its maximum level and I'm going to back off my stretch. And as I back off my stretch, you can see it joins back up again. Right. 
but then you say, well, I haven't, um, I haven't stretched my image quite enough and uh, to, to my liking. And, and that's true. And just sometimes with certain images, when you're too far in front of the histogram peak, and that's the place you want to be, you will bifurcate the image. And there's nothing wrong with executing the stretch at that point. Oops, I got executed on this image. And then going back for a second stretch. So again, I want to zoom in on the left-hand side. I can actually see it here, so I don't need to really set my SP to that number right back near the histogram peak and add some B. And now you can see I'm back to stretching the image without bifurcating. I am starting to bifurcate and you'll notice that even if I'm not bifurcating, you see this image is going down and it's going back up. Well, that's not a great thing to be doing to my image. You remember, if you, if you recall, when I was describing that really good um, um, histogram, it goes over the peak, goes to a line, comes down the peak, and then moves to a sort of straight line that's decreasing. You don't want it increasing. That tends to not look great. So this time, I'm going to get rid of that peak by reducing my B factor. And you see, I'm getting a fairly good straight line now. Fairly good straight line now. I'm going to reduce my stretch a little bit. Increase B a little bit. And now do my SP adjustment. Now this little click high sensitivity, you only need to do that when you're stretching a linear image. This time I'm not stretching a linear image. So if I move SP back, I can get rid of that. Oh, I've got it all the way at zero. Well, that's where it belongs then. Get rid of this. And I'm not doing too bad here. I've got a little bit of a hump here and a little bit of a secondary hump there. So I'm going to take that stretch. And it's going to restretch for me once again. I usually get this in two shots. I'm a bit astounded that I didn't get this in two shots this time. So each time I'm stretching a little bit more and I'm pretty good here. I'd like that to be a straighter line. There we go, that's good. That'll work. So at this stage, I've got a fairly decent stretch. Um, could be a little brighter, but I don't want to get too bright or I'm going to lose some of the some of the details on the edge of the moon here. But you can see from this image that I've got a bit of a hump in the middle. And whenever I see a hump in my histogram, that tends to indicate I've got a little bit of bunching up of pixel brightness. I don't have enough contrast in part of my image. And you can see a lot of this moon area is basically the same brightness. And that's what's causing this hump there. I can check that out by just clicking in this space somewhere. And you can see that it's kind of landing, oops, that's kind of landing in this hump in the middle. So I can fix that hump in the middle by kind of putting it in the middle here, making that my SP point. I just want to go gently on my B here. And you can see I can stretch that out at that point and make it a little bit flatter. And you can see I am putting a little bit of contrast into my image. So when it's pretty good and flat, I can say, OK, I'll accept that. And it'll stretch my image and reset. 
And you can see I've taken that bump out of the middle and added a little bit of contrast in the moon. See on the right hand side, there's a little bit of a bump there. Let's get rid of that. I can send that to SP. And this time, because the bump isn't very broad, I'm going to start using a negative B somewhere in there, say. And then start adding some contrast. And you can see I am kind of flattening it out, but I'm also pushing it to the left-hand side. And I think I need to adjust SP a little bit to the right here and add a little bit more contrast till I spread that peak out. I don't want to create a, a bulge, but I'm getting rid of that secondary peak. You can see from my moon that I'm actually making it darker. And I'm making it darker because you can see that my stretch is actually below my identity line. So to fix that, one way I can fix it is just go back to this LP factor. I can bring that back up. And now you can see all I'm doing is doing a little bit of brightening on the right-hand side, a little bit of darkening on the left-hand side, pushing that peak down. I might have to add the stretch a little bit more until I'm happy. Try changing this to meet, to see if I can make it a little bit flatter. And then when I'm ready, this is a little minor thing that's occurring at the bright end. When I'm ready, I can get rid of that hump. So there, I've, I've got rid of most of the hump anyways. So at this stage, I've got, although you need to zoom in to see that, um, zoom in a few times. You can see I've almost bypassed the, the, the peak at all. You can only see it when I zoom in. You can't really see the peak on this left-hand side. Well, this that's all this black area in the blackness. So um, I can still make out my terminator. I haven't darkened it too much, but that's about the limit of what I can do with GHS on this image. I can't add contrast in here because I'm going to be darkening parts of it. That will darken another part. And I can't brighten some other parts because it'll brighten other pixels. So what I have to do is I have to go to some sort of other methodology here. And this one, I'm just going to show you um, local histogram equalization. So by making this fairly flat, I'm actually setting up local histogram equalization to add contrast. Now it's going to try and play a trick on our eyes. So it's going to violate that rank order. Um, and it's going to say, hey, as long as I'm not close to other pixels of the same brightness, I'll feel free to brighten and darken locally. Because it'll trick your brain. Because if two areas of the same brightness aren't close together, it'll be hard for you to compare. So I'm going to load that up. Actually, I'm going to show its, its default. Now, the parameters are in here. Of how far away does it have to, to look? Really, that's like that kernel size. But it's going to trick by adding some contrast locally. And uh, for example, if we look at our preview here of, of the moon, you can see that there's some parts that are showing quite a bit darker than when just stretched with GHS and parts that are brighter. And what it is, is it's violating that, that uh, rank order pixels rule. So it's doing a mind trick on you. Now, you can obviously add too much contrast and you're gonna say, oh, that's, that's doing something funny. It's playing a trick. Um, so your brain won't accept it. Um, you can change how far the pixels need to be to, to play the trick. Um, but generally, I find um, I, I can use something between uh, something's happening. I did not start the. Anyways, I can, I can uh, 
generally use a value of 2.5. Actually, I have a set of conditions here that I found work. The thing about um, local histogram equalization, if you use it too much, it's going to, it's going to, uh, you won't, your eyes won't be, and your brain won't be fooled by it. You'll, you'll, you'll say, hey, you're trying to play a trick on me. So you really have to watch the amount and I really reduce the amount. But it is having a, a good effect on my, the visual appearance of my image. So I'm going to uh, apply that. And as I apply that, just want to um, keep your eye on the histogram to the right because it's going to change the histogram to the right. So I made the image a little bit better. I think by adding some contrast within the moon itself. But you can see some of the flaws that I had, um, some of them get evened out by this. Some of the flaws might get a little bit worse. Now this is not bad at all. So I'm happy to accept that. And let's say uh, we did a pretty good job on the moon here. Um, and uh, let's uh, move on to another image. So I'm gonna be, Coming back to that theme of setting up um, some of these other processes by using GHS. And uh, some, some of them will um, change the histogram in ways that you, you need to fix that were unintended. Sometimes flaws that you have in your histogram going in get exaggerated by these processes. So it's good to use GHS to set up your image for those processes and then um, fix any unintended consequences afterwards. So this is an, an image uh, I took uh, through, through various color filters and uh, uh, hydrogen alpha filter of Bode's Nebula. Um, I do put the, add the hydrogen alpha back into the color image for my RB, RGB image that you see here. And I also had a luminance image, which I also added some um, hydrogen alpha and some uh, O3 data into, into this, uh, into my luminous uh, image. Um, I'm showing you a noise reduced version um, that's auto stretched here. Um, here is the, the non noise reduced version. I did and sometimes I do this, um, sometimes I do it with STF, sometimes I do this with GHS, is I take uh, basically my raw image and I will do a ridiculous stretch on it. Um, let's set your SP there. I don't have to actually set SP. I use a big B and then I overstretch it. And take a look at the image because I check the background I'll stretch it big time. And I know it's a terrible stretch, but I checked the background by moving SP back and forth, just particularly the background because I'm interested, is there actually useful data that, is there IFN I might have captured or what? And if I did capture some IFN, I might uh, um, decide to go get more images if it's noisy. In this case, there's not much background uh, information um, to be had. So uh, I just wanted to show that as a, as, a, as a thing I do. Now, if I put STF back on here, you can see I have zoomed in on the, the histogram here and I do wanna set the black point. Um, and I can tell, well, there's a couple of, a couple of few pixels back here near zero, but you can see I'm pretty good to, to uh, set my black point here, but I'm not going to use the linear image. What I'm going to do is set SP where I would want the, the black point to be. And I'm actually going to do it with the GHS function. I'm going to set um, uh, a high B here. I'm going to send this to SP and I'm going to move my HP, my linearizer all the way down to SP. What that's doing is making the stretch to the right of SP completely linear. And then when I add stretch to this, it's actually gonna shrink the right-hand side and I can move the SP, 
I can move the black point to wherever I want. It's actually not creating a black point. It's just compressing all these pixels. So the information isn't totally lost. Although if you approach machine language, uh, machine uh, um, um, resolution, you can lose some data. Um, but let's uh, just execute that on our image. Now, don't panic because this is just the STF hasn't been hasn't been adjusted. If I just click on the STF thing again, it'll go back and and do my STF uh, so I can see what I'm doing. So then I go back to my normal routine. Let's reset the parameters. I go back to my normal routine, setting SP at the histogram peak, employing a very large positive B, I move the slider all the way, and then show a preview. Now I have to get rid of the STF, or my preview will be funny. And you can see as I stretch, my image comes into, into play here. So let me zoom out so I can see my histogram. And you can see I am creating a pretty good stretch. As I increase my stretch, my, my uh, galaxy is really coming into view. But when I try and get it just about right, you can see I'm actually creating a hump. There's my background main histogram hump, but I'm actually creating a hump back here. Before I diagnose that, though, I want to make sure I'm at the right SP level. As I increase SP, you can see. It's doing quite a bit severe background. I do want to capture some of my background, not too much. So I like this little bit of, uh, of uh, side galaxy or whatever's going on here. So I want that, but I'm stretching way too much. Um, so I'm going to back off on my amount of stretch. Maybe I should back off a little bit on my B factor. Find out what kind of gives me this more or less straight line to the right of my stretch. And you can see I'm pretty good here. I'm pretty close to where I want to be. I can do another little assessment of, of SP here. You see if I got SP too low, I start brightening everything and the background becomes gray. Now, if I go too high, I start darkening some of the details. So I want to find that sweet spot of SP. Maybe I can add a little bit of SP here. I want to find that sweet spot of SP where I'm trying to get this little character thing to, to jump off a little bit of the page here. So that's not a bad compromise. I sit there and say, execute that. Well, that's not my noise reduced. That's the one I want to execute on. Yes. And that's not too bad. I do want to add a little bit of contrast right in the galaxy. And you can see I have created a little bit of a hump in the middle, so I might decide to um, you know, leave B at zero here because I want a broad base stretch. I might add a little bit of stretch here. But I don't want to stretch too much on the bright side, so I move that down. Could you turn on your preview? Stretch too much on the dark side, so I'm going to move some LP up. Oh no, I don't want to move LP up, maybe down a little bit more. And I want to make sure I am at the right SP. So I want, oh, I didn't ever switch to SP. There we go. Sorry, I forgot to send SP down um, from here down into, so now it's using the right SP. So now I can add a little bit of contrast right at SP. Uh, 
have I got that added at the right spot? Or like there, um, you see this middle slider moving over. Add a little bit more stretch. Now I want to control the brightness. Oh, I'm not looking at the preview. Now I want to show the brightness. You can see I'm adding contrast right in the middle of the, the galaxy here. I don't want it too bright. So I want to bring this HP down somewhere about there. Not a bad stretch for this galaxy. Now I could do a few, maybe I've got a little bit of a hump going there, but I, I could keep stretching, but uh, you're getting the idea of what, what I'm trying to do here. Let me get rid of this preview. Now, so I've pretty much done what I can do with GHS. So now I'm gonna try a different process and I'm gonna here, and I'm just gonna give you a teaser here. I've fooled around a little bit with HDMRT and it kind of works best when I've got my image fairly close. And now it's going to use wavelets to basically form another trick. It's going to boost the, boost the amplitude of some of the wavelets, decrease some of the larger wavelet amplitudes. So I now can bring some of the details of the, the, the galaxy into my image. Now, what this will do is actually playing a trick. It will darken some pixels, like by rights, the, the, this little um, um, dust lane here should, is, is being made pretty much as dark as out here. And, that, and that's not really the case, but it's, it's doing this trick. So it's adding contrast and you start to see the structure of the galaxy by doing that. But it does have some unintended consequences. If I looked over at my, let me get rid of the stretch that's on here. Here was my, um, here was my um, starting image. Actually, it's made the, the, in this case, it's made the image a little bit better in some cases. Um, it's made it actually straighter. There is a little bit of a hump here. There's a little bit of a hump here. I can go after those. Uh, I'm not going to at this stage. I'll show you more about that in a minute. But that's doing a stretch on a galaxy. The next one I want to show you is a little bit different image. It's of a uh, dark shark, uh, dark uh, nebula. And I'll show you what's different about this in a second. But let's uh, open GHS here. Again, for another stretch. And you see this is starting to be a little bit of a routine. This one also has a black point that's, that's fairly high. So I do want to click where I want the black point to go. I'm not setting the black point. I'm setting that to SP, my SP parameter. I am um, sending HP down to SP. So I'm linearizing the whole right-hand side. I'm adding some stretch and I can move, make sure I'm on the left-hand side. Essentially my black point this way. And then apply that. Again, it's affected by STF. Now I wanna do my real stretch send my SP, I put it near my histogram peak. Now I can zoom out, use a large B, start increasing my stretch as I move the stretch to the right. I always forget to look at what the images looks like. Take my STF back and you say, oh, what, wait a second here, I'm sort of missing my shark. It's not, it's not coming out. I did send this to SP, no, I didn't. Kind of missing my shark, it's not really coming out until I actually start bifurcating my 
image again. So now I'm creating a valley and we don't want those valleys. You can live with it if it's trying to do some sort of effect, like it's really making the shark stand out from the background, but it's kind of unrealistic because there's other nebulosity in the background. I don't like it. Um, generally, when you're bifurcating the image like this, you want to back off probably on both B and D, right? So I want to go up with a more modest B. I'm really not trying to manage just the shark. I'm trying to manage my stars. So higher B will be easier on my stars, but I have to limit my stretch. Again, it's not the end of the world. It just means I have to do uh, multiple stretches. So watch that your stars aren't getting jammed up on the right-hand side. If you see some of that happening, you can always add a little bit of HP. I like protection to increase the con contrast up there. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll go with that. Like, you don't have to be super precise other than SP, which uh, precision counts. But you can see I've actually kind of maybe marginally created a valley there. That's fine. So let's reset the stretch. Now I want to look at my image and say, OK, well, where is this shark on the histogram? So I can click on a preview. And I can click on the shark, and you can see this shark exists actually in my histogram peak. It doesn't exist out here like the galaxy did in the previous example. It's actually within this histogram peak. And if I want to brighten, this, brighten the shark, I know I want to be to the left of where the shark brightness is, but I want to be to the right of the background. So if I click on some of the background, you can see that's near the histogram peak. So that gives me indication where I want to add contrast in between those two points. So I'm going to put SP there. Now, just some modest B I'm going to start with because I'm starting from a nonlinear image. And add a little stretch to here. And you can see now the shark is coming out from the background. And I'm not being too bright on the stars. But if I increase B too much, I start to increase that, start to create that valley again, which I really don't want. But uh, so somehow you want to move back and forth with D and B so that you're bringing your, your subject matter out while not overdoing it on the stars. And that's kind of where I want to end up with this little, um, this little stretch. Because what I've done is um, now, not so much stretched this, but I've taken that histogram peak that was very small in the previous example. Now I've broadened it because that's where my subject matter is. So this placing of SP and everything is all about doing that with the subject matter. Um, it has to do with the, the image you're trying to do and what you're trying to show. And I'll show that again in another example very shortly here. But you can see this star up here, it's, uh, it's within the nebulosity. So it's got a huge halo around it. Some people might not like that halo. So you might say, well, what can I do about it? Well, there's not much you can do about it with GHS at this stage, um, because to brighten that halo or darken that halo would be to darken the equivalent on um, the, the dark shark itself. Now, as for other things, I could try local histogram equalization on this. Now, what I did find 
is a funny characteristic where it's trying to fool my eyes, but what it actually ends up doing with my image, because it's trying to increase the contrast where there's some contrast and internal is making the shark a bit blotchy, but it's also creating a highlight around. It's almost like someone went with a white marker and, and marked around the edge of the, the, the dark shark. And that's not gonna fool anybody. Um, so if I was to use LHE on this at all, I'd use a very um, low amount. You can see the effect that that has. It has a little bit of an effect of lightening the edges of the shark. Maybe I'm okay with that. And I would apply that. You'll see it will affect the histogram. Come on, run. That show a histogram effect. Hey, Dave, can I ask a so question? You can see it's made very little difference to the histogram in this case. Dave, what I I might do... Can you hear me? Yes. Hey, so the classic approach to dealing with the issue you mentioned of, you know, the shark versus the stars would be to separate the stars out. Yes. And just stretch the shark. Why not do that? I set you up for this. Okay, good. Okay. So normally I do exactly what you're saying. I separate the stars out from the subject matter. This star and a couple of the stars in this image are a problem. Because at least StarNet, I haven't, I don't have a star exterminator. Rec doesn't recognize that halo as a star. It thinks there's a star on top of this circular nebulosity that's there. Okay. So, yes, you're right. And I'm going to show you that as, as we go through. Let's see how far we get in this recording. Um, I'm going to show you that. But, but, that's just not an option for this image. So I'm trying to show what you can do. HDMRT will minimize it. But I do want to make another point, is that star is in that nebulosity. And it is creating a halo. It is in my data. GHS isn't making up that halo. It is there. Remember I said GHS won't do anything? It just doesn't know that it's a star or not a star or a halo or not a halo. It, it's not that smart. So that star is got, does have that bright halo around it. Now it may look better on a poster if you get rid of that halo. And it may be more artistically pleasing if you get rid of that halo. It depends on what your purpose of your image is, okay? I know with HDMRT will um, sort of minimize that halo. So I have dimmed it, but it is still there. HDMRT is not going to, to make something up. Um, it's following some defined rules. But again, I'm changing my... Um, Histogram, and I'll, I'll be showing you that later. So on to my next stretch. So I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and uh, show an image that's just made out of stars, basically. There is a nice galaxy in here too, but uh, here's the Hercules uh, cluster. And this one is taken with a one-shot color camera. So it's showing RGB. So I'm just going to, um, I'm, if I'm sounding like a broken record, I, I will stop soon because the process is basically the same all the time. Um, oops, I forgot the new page. P 
key down, add stretch to get rid of my black point or to get rid of that gap on the left-hand side, execute that. I just want to get rid of that uh, STF. You set my parameters, put SP near the histogram peak, big B and stretch it out. I'm going to, what I'm actually doing is I'm stretching three colors here at the same time. So I'm actually doing three stretches at once because this is a color image. So I'm gonna bring that up into view and it actually pretty much with that default setting doesn't cause any hist, oops, let's reset that SP. I do wanna vary SP. Oh, I do wanna look at what I'm doing too. So here's my image. So I can stretch a little bit too much. Um, move SP to see where am I bringing the background out? I don't really want that background. I want it to fade, but I don't want to fade the dimmest stars. So I move HP up until I get a nice image. The other thing I want to be careful of is now I'm creating a hump. So I don't want to do that. So I'm going to back off that stretch, right? Maybe I can do with a little bit lower B here because the stars are fine. Now the last thing I want to check is the core of this cluster. Because I want to make sure my stars are resolved right to the core of that structure. And that really has to do with the B parameter I'm using. If B is that's a bit too much B, you can see that I'm uh, uh, I'm losing some of the contrast in the cluster itself. That's pretty good. So I can say, um, let's execute that. So the problem with this image is that I don't have a lot of color in this. And that tends to happen as you're as you're increasing brightness, the saturation is actually saying the same. Saturation is really the difference between the color intensities at a given pixel. It's really the difference. And the brightness is really the average. So as I'm moving the average up, the ratio of the difference to the average decreases and it tends to bleach out images somewhat. And there's two solutions to this. Um, one is, um, I should have made a clone of this image. I can make a clone of it now. The first result, let me invert and take that back to linear. I'll take that one back to linear. Didn't click the invert button. Get back to that later. The first thing I can do is select a saturation stretch. So here's the saturation in my image now. Oops. What did I do? Did I just execute it? Oh, that's preview. Here's the saturation in my image now. Um, now, when I'm doing saturation stretches, I probably want to use a negative B. I use between minus one and minus two. This is actually the arc shine equivalent sort of parameter. And I like to increase the saturation. And if I zoom in, you can see I'm starting to bring some color into my stars. Really want to stretch saturation so that its peak is somewhere in the middle of 
of values somewhere around 0.5 or so. Um, and you do that basically to taste. Now, one of the things that stretching color saturation can do is it can cause a minor amount of clipping um, in, in your images, which might change the hue, um, especially if I overdo my stretch. Like if I really overdo my stretch, you can see I really change the hue and, and uh, uh, um, can really cause some issues. So try not to make the histogram peak much past the center point if you're stretching saturation. I think that looks pretty good there. The other way I can add color to my stretched images, oh, well, maybe that's too much color. Oh, because it's repeating the stretch. Um, well, I do want to show you that little galaxy because it came out kind of nice in here. You can see some colors in that. That's not its core star, by the way. It just it's just a foreground star that makes it look like it, but pretty good, pretty good result. If I go to my other image, let's let's restretch that again. I can uh, if I go to preview. No, sorry, view, explore windows. If I go to history, I can take out, I can pick this Hercules image that I have there. It's this image. And it's listing the stretches that I've done. I know this was the second stretch. The third, the first one was my, my uh, black point. The second one was my stretch. And the third one was my saturation stretch. I'm after this stretch and I can pull that out of history. If I double click on that, that's the original stretch I did on this image here. This one's a clone. But instead of an RGB stretch, I'm going to select the color stretch this time. And this does what the arc shine function does. And here's what it looks like. So what it does is not an RGB stretch. What it does is a brightness stretch, but it doesn't apply that brightness stretch to the image. It actually applies that ratio of the brightness of the stretched image to the brightness of the starting image. It applies that ratio to each of the individual colors. And that means that each of the, the saturation increases as the brightness increases. And that also retains um, uh, the colors in the image. Now, some clipping occurs here. You've got various ways to um, look after that. Um, Mike came up with this RGB blend method. It's the best method. Just leave it there. Um, you can try clipping also was our initial stab at this. But I would just leave it there. It does a great job. Um, you're actually blending in the RGB image so that no clipping um, is actually taking place. So there's minor, minimal effect on your image by using hey, this. Hey, so Dave, I got a question. I'm going to apply you. that. Hey. And that's two ways of bringing out the color. Um, Dave, can I ask a question on that image? Sure. I see this when I've used GHS, and I see it on your image now too. You, you have a number of stars that sort of look like billiard balls, right? Where they're colorful and have like a white dot in the middle. Yeah. And what is, why is that? Is it, anyway, I haven't, how, how you deal with that? So I, I will show you later how to deal with that exactly. Okay, I will address that problem entirely. Um, just for now, what it is, is the saturation cannot be accommodated. Like if you think of saturation as the difference between 
the colors. And let's say we got a two color thing, we got red and blue. And let's say the saturation, there's 0.1 brightness saturation difference between red and blue. And that's giving you the color of the star, say. Now you want that brightness to be 0.95 or 0.98. Well, if you go to the 0.98, you can't accommodate that 0.1 difference in saturation and still average out the brightness of those pixels at 0.98. So what you have to do is reduce the saturation. If you're at 0.98, the maximum saturation you can have is um, 0.04. That's the only way you can get the point eight. So as you brighten things past the, the level that they can um, um, accommodate that saturation, it whitens out the center of the star. Closer where the star is less bright, it can accommodate that saturation. And that's why you see the color sort of appear in those circles around the stars. Does that answer your question? I do have a solution for that. It's um, coming up. I'm not sure I'll have time to show you this evening that solution, but uh, hopefully right. we'll address that. Thanks. Okay. Can I oh. ask one, um, one little question on that? I'm going to have to go in a second, but I, I've scratched my head on that a lot. Do you think that's, that, that issue also is something to do with acquisition? That if you have um, acquired too much brightness in the RGB channels, uh, you tend to uh, completely saturate the center of the star. Is that also a factor here, or is that just is it, is this mostly a processing problem? No, it 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 can be either. If you've oversat, if you if you've saturated the center of a star in all three colors in your imaging, if they're all at one. Well, your camera's recording them all at the same intensity because you've clipped the saturation for the same reason. Right. I just want to comment. I noticed that with my CMOS camera, that it's so sensitive that it gets really bright values for all the RGB values. So I've had to tone back the acquisition times. I just yeah. I don't want to distract everyone, but I just wanted to make a comment on that. That it it, it it's a tr it's very tr I've scratched my head on this problem a bit too. Well, when when I'm if I, if I'm taking a cluster like that, I just make sure I don't overexpose my image, particularly in the center of that cluster. Like you want to yeah. see the stars right at the center of that cluster, so you you tend to dial back your exposure to make sure you don't do that. But when you stretch back up, you're trying to use your entire spectrum. So the solution to that, and um, I'll, I'll jump to it, but essentially um, I'll, I'll jump to that and then we can finish off the evening and maybe we can um, um, come back. Um, when I've got, a couple more examples of bodes, and I do bodes with uh, with uh, not because I'm jumping ahead. I think the last one's the star list. When you get um, when you create a star mask, oh, just gotta find where I. When you extract the stars, you create a star mask like that. I think a lot of people just throw this thing away. But if you want to stretch Loom without the stars, don't throw your star mask away. Because in linear form, when you when you add it to um, your your starless image, you get your stars back again. And the secret is in how to stretch them. So if I go to GHS on here, 
And the, the, the normal way you sort of stretch a, an image here is you would um, get rid of the STF and you would say, oh, I want to be protective of the stars and I would stretch the image normally. And you get your stars and maybe you say, you want to keep some contrast in the stars. You don't want to overstretch them. You don't want these big halos, but you want some contrast in them. Well, here's one of the things you can do with the, the invert image. Now, when you invert the image, remember I said SP was where you're adding the most contrast. Well, if I invert the image, SP becomes where I add the least contrast. The point is, what I want to do here is actually put SP all the way to the top. So I'm going to try and make stars with the least amount of contrast I can. So I can do that by stretching in invert mode with SP all the way right hand side. I can stretch the stars. You can see I'm bifurcating them there. I'm just stretching the brightest stars. What I have to do is reduce my B factor. You can see how that's changing my, my stretch. If I reduce my B factor, I can create basically contrastless star mass. So I've taken a heck of a lot of the contrast out of these stars. You can still see the spikes and you can still see some dim halos there. So maybe I back off that so much, but essentially you can see these, these stars are basically round and flat. If I increase the stretch, I increase their size. And if I decrease the stretch, I decrease their size. So you can pick whatever size and sort of brightness you want there. The other thing I can do is I can move SP to the left. And that's going to keep basically the stars the same shape, but dim them. So if I take the dim stars, they're kind of round, um, very little contrast in them. They're only 0.75. Bright. So if this is going on a black background, it's, they're not the brightest things going. But the nice thing about keeping this below 100%, below completely, completely bright, is now they can accommodate color saturation. So what I do is I add this star background. It's actually a blend of back into... Um, back into my stretched, which I'll show you. I add that back into my stretched. I can also do deconvolution. I'll go over this the, the, the next time I present this. Um, I can actually contract create low contrast stars. Uh, these are low contrast stars. I can also actually create high contrast stars. Um, but I, when I add this back into um, my luminance, I get these low contrast stars, right? Here's another example with, uh, I contrast stars. So you can see here's a high contrast star with a very small center and some, some um, halos around them. And here's a low contrast star. But remember, I only made this 7%. So when I add this, when I blend this with an LRGB blend, um, when I add that to an LRGB blend, let 
in my color combination. I've done some touch ups to this too. So you can see because I, I didn't completely brighten these stars, you can see they've kept their color in the, that non donut y manner for the most part. There's a little bit of donut there, and I could remove that with noise reduction, but you can see the the, the, the stars are more or less uniform color to them. Now, if I left them at 100%, they'd be essentially white through most of them and a little bit of color fringe on, on the extreme edge. Does that answer your question, Jerry? Yes, it does. It's very, it's very interesting. There's um... I understand that. Um, I understand exactly what you're doing. That's very sophisticated. I have to put that in as uh, method forty-seven point three for the for dealing with this problem. It's it's really a a mind bender, and I, it's very. I find this very interesting. Now your lecture. I have to go. Unfortunately, I'm going to get divorced. But I, I what what I think your lecture is very interesting is where you move that symmetry point, you know, and uh, and you can stretch either end of it now. So I, I, I have made another quantum leap in my understanding of GHS. So um, it's very helpful. Uh, but I'm going to have to take off. But thanks very much, David. Yeah, you're welcome, Jerry. Um, I kind of went out of sequence and we're kind of out of time here. Should I... Uh... Hi, should we call it a... a... Yeah, um, it's totally up to you. I'm happy to call it a night. Um, if, you know, oh, your call. I mean, we started an hour late and it's late. Well, I can keep going if, if you like. Oh, I, up to you. We still got, a, you know, of the people who started, they're still here, uh, other than Jerry. Um, your call. Well, I can, I can keep going. Okay, great. So that, that, that did answer my question so your question you know my question was what about those donuts i keep getting that's a good word for them and your answer was sort of you can flat you know if you've separated out the stars you can flatten them uh in in that way and get and make room for the saturation and then the root cause of the donuts is sort of the inability to saturate further you know i i didn't mind the white in the center, what bothered me was sort of the discontinuity, you know what I mean? The fact that it was, you know, colored and then white, and then there was no like sort of ramp to white. I mean, it's pretty discontinuous the way it changes colors, but I guess that happens where you run out of, of room to, to for your saturation. All of a sudden you can't do it anymore. Yeah, so, so the way, um... The way that RGB blend works is 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 quite good. It it doesn't eliminate that because there is no way of eliminating that. Um, is the short answer. But what it does do is it minimizes the impact. Right. So, yeah. Is that fair to say, Mike? I think that's absolutely right. Yes, I mean there there is the other there's the slider below um, the RGB blend which allows you to 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 actually blend some of the RG, some more of the RGB image in, and that can sometimes help a little bit in terms of of just smoothing that um, smoothing uh, it out. Yeah, that that change. Okay, so I'm going to start taking a few shortcuts. Uh, I've got an image here. This is of the Pegas Pegasus uh, globular cluster. Um, it's um, a little bit different because it actually, I went deep with a uh, with, uh, luminance uh, filter to get some IFN in this case. And um, I was kind of richly uh, rewarded it, but I just want to show what you can do to sort of customize your, your, uh, 
your, your stretch, you can actually customize to what you want to show. So I'm actually going to create three clones here and briefly show you the stretch that, that I'm going to do. The first one I'm going to call a, 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 a sort of neutral stretch. Um, zoom in. I've already taken care of the black point here, so I just pick near histogram peak and bring up a preview, set B to very big, start increasing this. And I can Got to be protective of the stars. You can see that I'm starting to go up on the right hand side. So even though I've got B all the far to the right, I still need to add a little bit of HP to be protective to the, the stars. I can zoom into the globular cluster in my preview. Now you can see I actually did a deconvolution on this and uh, I wasn't able to take all of the stars out. It didn't recognize the center of this globular cluster as just a bunch of stars. So it left them in my uh, nebulosity image and I ended up having a little bit, of, little bit of ringing going on. But ignore that, um, it was a shame, but I didn't wanna sacrifice the deconvolution. I'm getting pretty good uh, resolution of my stars. I can put the entire image and I can move SP to where my IFN sort of pops out to the degree I want it to, I can actually make the IFN almost go away. So if I sit here and say, okay, here I've got some IFN, I kind of like that, I'm going to, um, Preview. And I'm going to say, call that, um, call that neutral, because this is what the image kind of naturally gave me. If I go to the next one, and I can just bring that one focus and it'll do the same stretch. If I look at the preview and get rid of the STF, that's basically duplicating. Now we did talk about if I increased SP, I'm going to go onto the front of that histogram peak. That's where my IFN kind of lives in this peak going on here. So if I move SP in front of it, it'll push that peak back. And you can see I'm getting rid of my IFN but I am starting to create this valley. I don't want to create valleys in my histogram. So I can back off B a little, but I don't want to back off B too much because I start impacting those stars. So I'm going to have to back off on the overall stretch. Now I could, and when I did this, this is exactly what I did, but I had to return for a second stretch to make the whole thing brighter, I wanted to go in fairly close to the histogram peak. I want to use a gentle stretch, like an arc shine sort of stretch, so I can brighten everything up more or less. But leave that IFN in the background. Maybe I can should increase SP. Increase it a bit more, maybe. A 
leave that IFN very much in the background. So let's apply that. And let's take our third image. I didn't save it, so I have to, I could go extract what I, the stretch I did, but I'm gonna do a little bit different stretch here. Send to SP. Start off with the big. Big stretch. Now I want SP a little higher. It's a linear image, so I have high sensitivity on my SP. What am I looking at? Now you can see as I move SP to include more IFN. I'm actually making it more the star of the show here. If I zoom out on my histogram, see I've moved that quite a bit to the right. I actually want to reduce my B because I don't want so much contrast between all the levels of, 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 uh, IFN that I'm going to get. So I can do a reasonable job here. I do want to tone down the brightness though. And make the IFN a little bit more the star of the show here. So what I did with that is then I just stretched the, here's my RGB image. I did gather some RGB data, but doing that. Well, PixInsight just crashed on me. Okay, I can get that back quick. So here's three versions that I did uh, earlier. So here's my high IFN, here's highlighting the cluster, and here's the balance. So when I open that, uh, when I, when I uh, combine that with my RGB data, You can see in this, this is my RGB data that I stretched. I didn't really have much IFN information. There was far less fewer frames taking of my, of my uh, RGB data. And I just wanted to get the color information because most of the detail information is in my luminance. So when I LRGB combination, everyone knows, hopefully knows how to, how to do that combination. And I got two of them here. Here's the here's my highlighting the IFN data, hi, hi, highlighting the IFN image, 
and here's my highlighting the cluster image. So really the same data can be customized depending on how do you stretch it to highlight whatever it is you want to highlight in your image. So I'm getting pretty close to the end here. So I think it might be great if we can just plow through. Sounds good. So I wanna go back to um, color for, for a moment. Um, and actually I'm gonna go back two steps. I'm gonna quickly show Oh, I skipped way ahead there. I want to go back. To doing the starless image. Go back further. No, I can't because I don't have my uh, don't have my I'm sorry, I'm going to have to pause here to uh, load a project up. No, it's not open, it's file. No. File. Load project. Sorry, this is going to take a couple of minutes. Um, but I did want to highlight both in a star image and a starless image how it's necessary to set up. Um, and, and it's very helpful to set up DBE and um, particularly HDMRT and sharpening routines and any, anything like that by setting it up with the best histogram, the best image that you can get from GHS. So remove those bumps remove all those things that uh, will, will uh, can make GHS, uh, HDMRT and, and uh, LHE basically do a poor job on your image. Then once they have um, been run on your image, you really need to, um, fix any bumps and uh, valleys that you happen to find, make it conform to that ideal as much as you can, um, because there'll be unintended consequences of running HDMRT. You'll see that it will affect your histogram. So what I'm really missing, this loads. It only takes a minute. Should only take a minute. There we go. So if we go to the 
if you recall, that was my Bode's initial stretch. And you might say, okay, well, let's open up GHS, take a look at the histogram in log view. You can see this wasn't a bad histogram. I have a little bit of a bump there, but let's, let's do uh, HDMRT on it. Hurry up and wait, fix insight. You see, I'm starting to get bumps, but I've actually got a little bit of a concave down thing going on here. So what I might do there is lift the center part by actually doing an invert stretch, setting SP about here. taking some contrast away. So I can make that curve closer to, to straight going down. And, and that's sort of repairing what I did with HDMRT. So I'll do that repair to the image. See it's brought out some of the dark nebulosity again. Um, there are kind of quite a few bumps still along the road here, but then if I do another round of, of HDMRT, so you know, I see I'm getting a little bit of a dip in here. Now, <clears throat> there's various ways people deal with that. They blend the HDMRT result back with the previous image, or they take the max of one and the minimum of the other. Um, it's doing its job. It's showing me some of the details in here, but it's also creating some effects like, like this here. So I want to get rid of that uh, concavity that that's in that image. So I'm going to do an invert stretch again, send that to SP and a little bit raising that up. Now I've got another bulge coming here that I need to get rid of. Um, but it really helps in the subsequent images by continuing to do this correction, fixing these bumps, It'll, it ends up with a different, with a much better result. So I do want to fast forward here and open so hopefully this plays forward. So what you can see is the progression of running HDMRT, fixing with GHS. As I move to a final luminance image. Okay, and then I can combine that with a stretch color image. And I did a terrible job of stretching this color image, but you have to realize what I was after was the color. So I didn't really care. And perhaps in hindsight, I added a little bit too much hydrogen alpha to this, this image, but I end up after I combine it. after I combine it, um, end up with a, a decent image of the Bode's galaxy. I don't really like the stars, 
because these stars, as I was doing all these processes, these stars were affected by the process as we went along. So let me get rid of these things. You can see the image go in reverse order back to my initial stretched image. So then I want to show another version of the Bode's galaxy, this time with starting off with the same color and same color and luminance image. I extract, I guess I never saved the, the starless image. Oh, yes, I did. Okay, so here's the star mask that I removed from this starless image here. Uh, no, that's not the starless image. It's right here. Now, a lot of people sort of shun deconvolution, and, and I mean real deconvolution here, not, um, not uh, um, artificial intelligence deconvolution. This is obeying the, the, the true math behind deconvolution, although it is an iterative process. So it is only approximation to, to um, deconvolution. But uh, this is, just a fantastic um, process to do. On um, if you can make your image starless, you don't have to worry about any of those um, ringing artifacts, and it's just so easy to do. You can use the starry image to get a PSF, and I've loaded it here. Um, um, and I know this isn't having to do with GH, GHS as such, but all you have to do is load the, the PSF in here. You can, um, you should increase the wavelets to five. And I just go through and I sort of make this a diagonal running because it will create some problems in the noise. In fact, I tend to, first uh, do a black point adjust before I run deconvolution. That seems to help with any noise in the background. And uh, um, I got the right PSF loaded in here. And I'm just going to use five iterations, but it's just it's just a crime not to do it whenever you've got a uh, um, a starless image. It it's uh, being true to the data, um, and you're you're instantly getting um, a whole bunch of resolution going on. get to my undo. Ah. Only takes a second, but it, it just kicks off the whole processing on a good start by giving you as much detail as actually in the data without doing any of the, the tricks. Uh, I used to 
used to be a part of big part of what I did as an engineer was doing deconvolution on time series data. Um, it uh, and then we couldn't go for any fake stuff. It had to be real. Um, but you can see the the resolution it's bringing out. Now I can do an undo and and that's only five iterations on deconvolution. Hopefully you can see that, but it it pays out huge dividends going forward. So I always do the starless part at the, at the linear stage. Oh, it's not doing very much because I started off. Oh no, it, that, that's fine. Here's after a few more um, iterations, I can all of a sudden see these striations in the dust lanes here. But then I do a um, then I do um, a noise reduction on that before going to GHS. But basically, why do I keep expanding that? When you're doing GHS, zoom in, click on the peak, send to SP, start off with the big B. Oh, I'm still on invert mode. Make sure I'm doing that correct. Send to SP, put a big B, start stretching. Now you see, I don't have to worry about my stars. I can place this pretty much wherever I want. It makes the initial stretch just so much easier not having to worry about those stars. So few reasons why I do it at the linear stage. One is so I can get that deconvolution in. And second of all, I can do my initial stretch um, and I can really focus in on the core of my nebulosity instead of worrying about all these extraneous stars. So I close this. I have a whole series of just like before. So you can see as it progresses how I'm and you could argue I'm getting too much detail into uh, doing um, even sharpening there, which which helps having your histogram open all the time. Um, but uh, I, I will show that with the GHS histogram. I'll take all the stretch off. So we're just looking at the histograms and you can start from um, the first GHS to the next first HTMRT. I fix that by doing a GHS stretch. I did another HTMRT. I fix that with a GHS stretch. Ooh, that's the wrong one. Then I did uh, local histogram equalization. I probably went too heavy handed on that one. Another GHS stretch. And then finally a sharpening. And uh, so I have GHS and you can see as I went through those, how this histogram is is being changed. And you see at the end, I end up with um, some contrast I need to add here. You can see that in the nebulosity here. 
Um, I want to add some contrast so I can leave B0 alone at the time. Maybe I want to set SP there. Uh, fix that somewhat. So generally what I'm taking SP up. When I'm doing these fixes, you see I take the old histogram and you can see the old histogram had this bit of a bulge before diving down at the end. And what I've done is um, add a little bit of stretch so that the histogram comes down more evenly, kind of crosses over and extends out further and comes down. So really using the old histogram and the new histogram as an edge to, to what um, is going on. I need to make sure that that looks good. I am brightening up too much. The center, because I want to leave that focus on that galaxy core. And then when, I, when I've done that, I can execute it. And then I may be going on to the next process I want to do. So it's this interlacing of running the process, taking what it does right, and then fixing any unintended consequences as a result from it, and then moving on as I, as I process my image always having that histogram in my mind as to what's going on. And then I think I showed you already how I stretched the star mask. Um, I, I stretched the star mask a couple of different ways to give high contrast and low contrast stars. Um, uh, then when I added it back in, I just added it back to that really bad, uh, color image and just a couple of little tricks that you might be used to. A lot of people do the curves right at the end and they add a little gentle S curves to take some of the contrast out of the low end, some of the contrast out of the high end. You can do that with GHS2. You can just uh, uh, say you're doing an invert an image and uh, leave SP at zero. Um, add a little bit of stretch. I'm going to add it with um, a little bit of a high, a modest B, I guess. And then bring HP down. So I'm most of the image is linear, but this is mimicking. The bottom half of an S curve sort of stretch. We'd have a lower part of the S and, and late in a second, I'm gonna put an upper part of the S there. But what I recommend is you look at the image and see what you're doing to it as you decrease that um, contrast right at the bottom end. I see I'm darkening the background. I'm doing it too much here. So I want to, sorry, I want to, uh, bring my SP in till it, it's kind of where I don't want to darken the galaxy really. I just want to darken this background. So that's the bottom half of my S curve. Um, I'll apply that. That's the image I'm working on now. Get too many images open. And then all I have to do is move SP to the very top and now use LP to control what I'm doing at the very top of the image. Now here I'm basically looking at the stars and the galactic core as to how much contrast I want to take out of it. In this case, I don't want to take much contrast out, but, but there you have it. So that's how you can do it, uh, you know, curve style, gentle S at the end, but you can do it with GHS. Thank you.
So a couple of really quick ones to show you. Here are some just raw drizzle files that um, you may have after taking narrowband. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about narrowband um, in this case. Now, one of the first things you probably wanna do is DBE. And I'll show you a bit of a shortcut using GHS to do DBE. Um, I always, uh, well, I generally do a channel combination here and I just pick, um, it's, H. I, set this up. Oh, I did set it up already. Do a channel combination. And what I do is open up GHS. Now this hasn't been color calibrated or it hasn't had anything, it hasn't had DBE done to it. So I'm gonna go in here and I'm gonna see where the colors are in relation to another. And I see that red happens to be weaker than green. Well, that's not surprising in an SHO image. What I'll do is I'll boost red somewhat. Just leave SP alone. Boost red somewhat. Oh, I got to select red. So I can stretch colors individually. So I just want red to be more over the green. And I want blue to be more over the green. So I just say, go do that. And then I um, go back to an RGB stretch. And I just, maybe I'll put SP somewhere in here. And I will stretch. The heck out of it. I'll move SP down. I see I'm making a, a real dog's breast breakfast out of this stretch here. So I'm stretching it way too much, but I'm gonna execute that anyways, because what I wanna do, I actually wanna move SP down a bit. because I wanna see more of that background stuff. So what do they do all this, create this mess for? It's so that I can easily pick my dynamic background points. So if you can, if you can see where my points are actually picked, I'm not gonna pick them, but I would start off with a new, um, new DBE, a clean, I'm gonna do that. Oh, I should just set reset. I would just go through an image like this so I can pick where I know my background I want to be. So I do this extreme sort of GHS stretch. So I know all these things. I know this is, this is probably background. This is probably dark right here. I can really hone in on where I want to pick my points. Then all I do is I might say, okay, if here's a DBE that I did pick before. And say, okay, well, I can um, check out the the model there. What does it What does it show me? It does show me a fairly regular sort of background, which makes me happy. I'm not getting any of my image in the background. And then when I've done that, I just simply save it as a process. I cancel that session. I get rid of this horrible stretch, but now I go back to my 
individual master files, open it up, and it'll place those points. And I can, with reasonable confidence, that in my oxygen, hydrogen, and sulfur data, I'm not picking, I am picking background in all those cases. And I can just set my target area to division and go away and, uh, and uh, do my DBE on my images. Get rid of that, open up my next image. I can, my points are all saved in this, this uh, process here. So I can just go through that and quickly do that. So that's how GHS can even help with DBE. A little bit more sophisticated color is when I've done my DBE and I do my channel combination and uh, I might get an image such as this. This is another SHO image. So I need to do some color, color calibration on this. Now, get rid of the stretch. Now, what I need to do is zoom in here and I know zooming in a hundred must be a good amount here. I can see my red, green, and blue. And in general, they won't align. Sometimes they align better. Sometimes they don't align so well. So let's say I want to align my red channel and blue channel with my green channel. Well, that's fairly easy to do. I don't have to touch anything but the amount of stretch. I have to make sure I'm doing the red channel, and I want to stretch this very slowly with the D. I want to stretch it past where I want to go. So let's say to the right of the blue channel. And then I want to bring HP back to line it up with green. Now, if I do this with the STF, you got to make sure it's locked on the color. You can see I have indeed boosted red. Now the background's showing up somewhat as purple. So I can fine tune if I select HP to fine tune here. I don't want the highest resolution, but I can fine tune red to overlie on my green. And generally, I'm wanting the left hand side of my histogram peak rise to show there. Now I can execute that. And now I want to work on blue. Blue's the opposite way. Blue's the opposite way, it's too high. So I fix that by moving SP all the way to the top. Now you can see I've move because I put all the contrast on this way. It's actually doing a shrink. It's moved blue to the left. And now I can move LP up. So it comp, so it overlies my red and the green. And there I've color balanced my image. And it will give me set stretch, it will give me my incredibly green, typical SHO color balanced starting point. Now, the whole beauty of being able to stretch individual colors, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this in, in a couple of moves. Um, one thing you'll notice that the green is much broader histogram than red and blue. And that's why red and blue tends to be combined to the dark parts of the image and green dominates um, for, for much of this image, although you can't really see it here. Um, so how do I get enough blue and get enough red into the image? Well, here, if I just, let's say we want to work on red first. If I put SP right into the middle of my um, histogram, 
that's where I'm going to add the most contrast. I want to use as much B as I possibly can because I want to inject some contrast into that blue, into that red, sorry. And you can see as I stretch it out, and maybe we don't want to look at the log file here, but as I stretch it out, and then I linearly bring it back, you can see it's not as high as it was once. What am I doing wrong here? I need to move SP a little bit back. Log. I want SP to be a little bit behind the histogram peak. Sorry. Oh. So let me repeat that. So I show you a little bit better. So there's my starting D. I'm going to put SP there. I'm going to increase. I'm going to give it a fair amount of, of um, stretch and then bring it back. And you see it will be a, more stretched than it was. So I can refine that. Why isn't this bringing more red into the image? There we go. So as you can see, I'm making red broader and broader as I increase my stretch factor. So I need to make sure I keep it. Need to make sure I keep it sort of aligned so it's color balanced still. But you can see as I increase it, its breadth, I'm starting to get red into this part of the image and other parts of the image that you can see. And the whole overall image is turning a little bit more yellow from its original green. So there's its green. You see, I'm injecting a fair amount of red into that image by spreading it out. So if I execute that, then I can work on blue the same way. There. Switch this to blue. So now blue is getting uh, a little bit more wider than it was to begin with. And in fact, I'm starting to see some blue in this part of the image here, seeing a little bit of blue around this star here. And I'm actually sort of reducing that overall green effect. Apply that. Now I'm starting to get some red down here. I'm starting to get some blue here. So that might be the starting point of my stretch. So now I'm going to switch to RGB and actually stretch my color image here. 
stretch all three colors at the same time. Come out. Oh, I didn't send that to SP. There we go. Sometimes I forget to send it to SP. <laughs> go, Why is this not working the way I want? But I can bring the image out. And when I do that, I don't want to bifurcate. So I have to reduce this and maybe do it in a couple of stretches. Ah, we'll say that's good. Um, Now, Dave, do you have much left? Um, I guess we've gone on two hours at this point since the actual start. Okay, do you, I, I'm not very far from being done. I, I promise. All right. You think you can finish it up in 10 minutes? Sure. All right, let's give it a shot then. Thank you. Okay. So at this point, um, I can stretch the individual colors again. Do you want to, want to do one more stretch here? To really bring out that, bring out the nebulosity here. So at this stage, I can again return to the individual colors. If I want some more red in my image, it was very hard on the background. See, it's got a bulge right there. So I want to um, get rid of that. It'll increase the red in parts of the image. Bring it back forward. See, I'm adding red to the image even more so because I can stretch the individual colors. And I can do the same with blue. Um, I can do the same. And I, I'm really minimizing the green. So what, I, what I've done here is taking my initial color balance, color adjusted um, stretch, stretch red and blue individually even further. So I'm getting even more red after I did my color and even more green, oh, sorry, more blue in amongst this green. At this stage, I've got basically a couple of different options I can do. I can do an LRGB combination by setting green at 80%, I think I did for this case, which is one way I can bring out these reds in this foxmas cone, these blues around here, yellows around the, the, the cone nebula and some greens left over, or the alternative I can do is the more classic, um, the more classic, oh, I actually loaded that up already. Green removal through SCNR, and that gives me my more classic Hubble palette image. So really you can manipulate the, the colors um, 
that sort of way. And then when I when I bring in the luminance um, by making a star mask, stretching my star mask. I bring in my luminance that has all the detail involved and I end up getting, um, combining that detail with the color manipulations I did. This was for the one that was LRGB uh, modified. So the final one, and I'm gonna make this a real shortcut that I'm gonna talk about, is Tadpole's Nebula. And where I wanna to get to is I start off with Unfortunately, on the previous image, I didn't have any RGB information. I didn't take any, but here's one where I took, this is the Tadpoles Nebula. I took a lot of RGB data, and I especially took a lot of SHO data. I went totally starless, not only on the, not only on the luminance part, but I went starless on the, um, starless on the color images too, and uh, ended up with a star mask, of course. Here's my RGB data. Here's my SHO data. Um, and here's uh, my luminance data with all the detail. So I combined those. And in fact, I did something really tricky was I actually combined my RGB data with my SHO data. So this is actually a color blend of those two images that I then added my luminance in for all the detail. So this is all fine and well, and you can do this really well. You can do deconvolution because it's starless. You can do all sorts of things because it's starless. But at the end of the day, I wanted to add in my um, add in my RGB stars because I wanted the stars to be RGB. Now I can't do that directly using that star mass stretch, adding it to the luminance and then because the fundamental color of my RGB, all of my luminosity is a different color. Um, all my star colors are, will be different if I write over with stars with a base with a base color that's different. So I will change the color of the stars. So instead of um, doing that blending, I have to do masking. So the way I the way I do that is. It's coming up. So I again stretch my star mask with GHS the same way as I did showed you previously. by setting um, the invert. So I want to take all the, the, the contrast out of the, I'll take a lot of the contrast out of the stars. This time I'm not going to 
stretch them too much, but this is actually going to become a mask that I place over the image I want to add the stars into. Then I I take my original RGB image. Clone that. Space to. Try to this. And I'm going to stretch this thing. Sorry. Just a basic stretch. I'm not even going to worry about the black point here. Now, the only thing I need to worry about is that my stars are bigger than my mask, or I could potentially get some ringing going on. I want to make sure I absolutely do everything to capture the color. So I don't want to stretch my stars too much, but I do want to do a color image because I really want that star color. Sure, I don't stretch the stars too much, so they've got lots of color in them, but I do want them pretty big. So we'll call it there. Then I can just use my pixel math to transfer those stars. Mask. And transfer those nice RGB stars right into my image. So all sorts of things I could do I could apply that twice, make them a little bit brighter and a little bit bigger, depending on what I want. Um, I can, while that mask is in place, I can go to um, saturation and, uh, sorry, go to saturation. Increase my saturation because it's just applied to the stars now. You can see I get nice RGB stars on my nebulosity that has absolutely nothing to do with RGB. Now I can control my mask a little bit more and I've actually created a couple of in images. Um, I can show you, here's some other examples of various degrees and various sizes and various shapes of stars that I've planted on there. Um, one thing you can do, one last thing I'm going to show you is if I take this, this is the one I was working on. Let's 
is what I was looking at. Let me take those stars out for a second. And uh, let's do another invert image. And what I'm going to do here, no, I won't, I won't do the invert image. I'll just um, do a negative B, move my SP. So I'm going to do a gentle dimming of this image. So I want to make sure my mask is not enabled because I just want to dim this image somewhat. Now I can enable my mask, then do my star transfer. then do my saturation boost. Over boost a little bit here. Then open up, oh, I didn't save my stretch. Then I can, Disable my match, my, my mask, and then go to my SP. I think my parameters were something like that. And invert that stretch. So I brighten up the image again, but I'm also brightening up the stars. So if I want light, really bright stars, well, I'm gonna lose some color because I've brightened up the stars, but now I get the overall thing. So that's how you can use GHS to help put whatever RGB stars into whatever image you want um, without losing the, the fundamental star color. Well, that's a beautiful image there, Dave, <laughs> and, and a great presentation, too. Yes, thanks for being patient and allowing me the extra time. And I'm sorry about all the computer glitches. Well, I'm glad we got it in, though. Um, you know, it was a tough problem to solve, but. Yeah, we got there. Method. And, and thanks for our participants who stuck along this whole time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you, everyone, for attending. Hopefully you see like GHS is part of the entire, uh, my entire workflow. It's integral and it's embedded in the entire thing. So uh, if I just showed you a couple of tricks or you decide to embed it yourself, um, good luck with it. It's a lot of fun to use and it's really my artist's brush, I call it. All right. Well, well thanks again, Dave. And um, we'll put this up on YouTube and, and uh, we'll talk next time. Thanks for everybody. sticking around. Yeah. All right. Bye bye, everyone. Thanks, Dave. Bye.